Hey, John here. Let's look at the C++ standard template algorithm library sort function, okay? How do we call this? There's two basic ways, right? You've got your sort, and you give it an open-ended range using two iterators that are random access iterators, okay? So what is the implication of that? This sort function will only work on containers that provide random access iterators like the vector, okay? And specifically, what it won't work with is the standard list container. We'll talk about that in a minute. But with those containers providing random access iterators, this sort function will be applicable, all right? So we got two basic methods here. You've got the open-ended range, and you've got an open-ended range with this thing over here called a comparator, okay? Let's look at the open-ended range one first, right? So what does it do? It, I mean, it's going to sort the elements in this open-ended range. Now look at the wording they choose here, in non-descending order. You might say, well, that means it's ascending. Not necessarily. Look at this statement. The order of equal elements is not guaranteed to be preserved. Ah, non-descending means ascending or a string of equal values, okay? So be careful. This doesn't sort it in ascending order. You can't have ascending order if all the elements have the same value is the point. Now, this statement over here refers to the fact that if you have, you know, six elements with the same value, like maybe you have, a, what, A, G, B, G, C, and G, and you sort that, you'd want to get A, B, C, G, G, G. All right, so, but which G comes first in second and third, all right? So what this says is if there's three Gs in the data that before it's sorted, those three Gs may not be in the same order that they were when looking at from beginning to ending in this range over here when the sort is completed, okay? Sometimes that, that matters, sometimes it doesn't. You might argue, eh, it doesn't matter at all. Who cares if the values are, you know, if they're all the same value anyway, which, what difference does it make which one's first? Well, this becomes more relevant when you create a, a, a container that's filled with complex objects that have more than just a, a simple value associated with them. So let that be a word of warning as you try to apply this to increasingly complex situations. That's all I'm saying. All right, now, what if I don't want it sorted by default order, right? So by default order, what it's going to do is it's going to use the less than operator, which is what it talks about down here, right? So for example, number one here, right? So that, that's this one up here. That's what they're referring to. And that's what they say when they're talking about this version up here. How do they compare them? Now, the sort function will only use the less than operator when it's making the comparisons. Now, why do they make it a point to say this? Well, it's because they want to make sure that you understand that if you're sorting a complex object that might have overloaded operators and things like that, like maybe you have an overloaded greater than operator in your class and you're using that for other reasons in your code and you go to sort these things. Well, it's not going to use the greater than. It's going to use the less than operator. It won't use the equals it won't use greater than or equals. It won't use less than or equals. All right? So this is very clear about which operator is going to be used inside the template so you know what's going to happen to your class if you have overloaded operators in there, okay? Now, the, the, uh, the comparator will be used if you specify one, right? You've got this optional last parameter in here. So don't use the less than operator. Okay, I'll call this. And I'll use that to determine what's what. Now, it tells you exactly how it's going to use that comparator function down here. Now, let's read this very closely because I, I think this is worded in kind of a strange way. It makes it a little bit awkward here. So what does it say? A sequence is sorted with, with respect to a comparator comp, which is that argument right there, okay? If for an iterator IT pointing to a sequence of any non-negative integer n, such as blah, 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 blah. And then you get down here and you say, okay, I have this comparator and it has this 
uh, expression here, and then it says, or that evaluates to false, okay? Now, this is a true statement. However, in your brain, you might be thinking about comparing two elements, and the element on the left and the element on the right. And then you look over here, and it says evaluates to false. This is uh, kind of backwards, right? What's the, what, which element is this, right? It says up here that n is a non-negative integer. So this is technically the element to the right of the element of this iterator over here, in spite of the fact that it's on the left, argument to comp, okay? So by saying that this evaluates to false, this is sorting an ascending order because the one on the right is actually this argument over here and so on, all right? So this is kind of weird. Uh, or at least it's kind of weird the way they phrased it. The way I like to think about it is the comparator returns true if this value here is less than this value there. And what I'm saying is absolutely correct, in spite of the fact that if you don't think about what this statement says, it's talking about how it uses the results of the comparator. Okay, It's not telling you what the comparator will do. Okay, so the comparator will return true when the first argument here is less than the second argument there. All right, why? Because it has to fit semantically in the template of code in the same kind of logic flow where the template would normally just put a less than operator between these two arguments, okay? So this is kind of mixing two things, right? Do not confuse yourself. Don't think that this is talking about how the return value of the comparator is created given the arguments. This is talking about how it is used to do the sorting, all right? Now there's another variant here that includes this thing called an execution policy that has to do with what happens if an exception is thrown during the sorting process. I'm gonna leave that as a as a, a task to the viewer to get into that level of detail if you are so interested. Down here, it will tell you a little bit more about what happens, right? Uh, what I was just talking about with regard to what the, what the comparator should really do. This object, or, uh, you know, it's a function or a instance of a class with an overloaded operator, okay? It returns true if the first argument is less than the second, okay? So read this. When you're writing your comparators, don't read and misinterpret what this says up here, okay? These are both true statements if you think about them. But this one's a bit more clear when you're thinking about what the comparator function itself does in a vacuum, right? So it says if you write one, it should look like this. Complexity. This gives you some insight as to what the sort's really doing. Order n log n. Well, that's certainly not going to be doing a bubble sort, right? It's probably doing a heap sort or something like that. It looks like they try to improve it when they release C++11, right? Because it says uh, before C++11 was released, the sort uh, operation took n log n on average operations or comparisons, I should say. And the new version says it does n log n period, all right? So they changed the sort algorithm. It still sorts, all right? This will run more consistently, I suspect, than this one up here. Maybe that was the argument. You'd have to go back and read the, the discussions concerning the upgrades of the library if you really want to know why they did that. Here it talks about the exception policy and what happens if you run out of memory and stuff like that. And as is always the case on this website, I, I really like this, uh, these examples they have in here. But uh, they tend to also be everything including the kitchen sink, all right? So this could muddy the waters a little bit. This is great when you already know a little bit about sort and you want to know a lot more in minutia about what happened. You know, they got lambda functions in here. They're using the standard grader. They've got a, um, a functor object in here. They've got, uh, yeah, let's start simple. What do we got here? We got a greater than function in here. So this should just work. This is my uh, comparator that I'm going to use in an example, okay? And then I have a vector container with a bunch of numbers in here in somewhat random order. 
And what am I doing? I'm going to print out the contents of that initial container. I'm then going to call sort with my open-ended range. I'm going to just sort the whole thing using the default comparator, which we know from the documentation is that the sort will simply use the less than operator to perform all of its comparisons and ultimately leave them sorted in ascending order. So I print it out again. When we're done with that, I can put a custom comparator in there and just sort it again right here. Give it a pointer to a function to use instead of the less than. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a greater than. I'm going to reverse the order. Okay, So this thing should sort it in ascending order, print it out, and then sort it in descending order and print it out again. It's kind of funny that you use greater than to sort it in descending order, but that just <laughs> keep your head uh, uh, clear on what the comparator does versus what the sort does with the results of the comparator, all right? So let's run our example program here. No surprise, the initial one is somewhat random. We can sort it with a default and we got ascending, or shall we say non-descending order. And then we use a custom comparator and we get non-descending right? or non-ascending order, right? Which means it's going to basically go from uh, large to small, right? And that did not have any duplicates, so that kind of alleviates our, our concerns about that, all right? So let's look at this example. I'm comparing two strings, but I'm not really going to compare the string in its entirety. I'm going to compare only a substring. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sort them in ascending order, or as they say, non-descending order, based on the substring starting at the second character in the string. All right. So I'm only going to ca uh, co compare them, the parts that I'm highlighting here, right? That's what substr1 does. It says create a string whose value is the s2 string in this case starting at character 1 through the end of S2. And I'm going to use that as my values in my comparator here. All right. So what am I going to do here? I got a whole bunch of strings. Same thing I just did with integers. I'm going to just show you the initial value, sort it with the default, print it out again, sort it with a comparator, and print it out again. Using the second character, as the beginning of the string that we're going to use to sort with, right? So here's the initial vector. Here's what you get by default, right? Dictionary order, right? And now with my custom comparator, you can see that banana, starting with ANA, comes before EBR, comes before ELL, comes before HER, comes before ELP, comes before ORL, and so on, P, and so on, right? So this is the kind of thing you can do with custom comparators. Obviously, the <laughs> default is never going to do anything like this. If you really need that kind of uh, comparisons to be done, you're going to have to write your own. And along with the function, you can obviously also use a class that has an oper overloaded operator with a signature like the one you just saw in the documentation that can take the appropriate pair of operands and use them in the comparator function here. So what did I do here? This is going to just do a string compare by default. It'll compare the entire strings, but I can construct one of these and just give it any offset I want in this case. So this is essentially the same thing as the regular function, but because I have a class, I can do other things. I can have a local variable in here, and, and when I create one of these, I can use this to compare substrings starting at any offset instead of just the second character in the last example. So here, what do I got going on here? The same thing starts out the same way. You got the the, uh, the, uh, the random strings, print it out, sort it with a default, print it out. Then I'm going to sort it using comparator with one for the offset, okay, and print it out. Then I'll do it again, starting with the second character as the offset, right? So remember, this thing is not calling a function. It is constructing an instance of this class up here. All right, and the two and the one are the constructor arguments. So what it's doing is it's constructing one comparator instance with a one or a two, 
in the examples we're going to see. It stores that in here. Then it fires up the, the, uh, the sort function, gives it an instance of this object. And when the sort runs, it's going to execute this function with these two strings. Those two strings have to match the data type of the vector. Otherwise, the template function won't find it. All right, so this will be sorted in different ways, right? So here's the initial container, our default sort, what we just saw starting at position one, banana, zebra, hello. And then, of course, we sort it one last time starting two characters in, right? So BRA comes before EL, comes before ER, comes before LL, comes before NA, before PL, before RLD. Now, before we go, let's take a quick peek at the standard list container. Now, the thing about the list container is its iterators are not random access. So we can't just use the standard sort routines with the list. Okay, how do we sort a list then? Well, the list provides a special sort function, as you can see down here. And you'll notice it looks a little bit like the standard template library generic, you know, sort template function. This one will sort the entire list from begin to end, or it'll sort the entire list using a comparator. And all the other rules and details of how the standard template library sort function will apply. The comparator looks the same, and so on. And we even have our n log n. Now this one says approximately, so maybe this doesn't exactly use the same uh, sort algorithm as the standard template library sort does, but the list sort, I mean, it'll certainly get the job done, right? Uh, and here are these notes, right? So this is pointing out what I'm just saying. The standard sort requires, you know, uh, random access, so you can't use it. And this bit here about being swappable has to do with the fact that when you sort a linked list, what you're doing is relinking the elements that are already there. So that objects themselves are never constructed and destructed in order to be moved from one place to another in the memory, as is the case with the uh, standard template uh, sort function. So where the list is concerned, the object values in the list, the elements themselves, are not moved around. They're just relinked, okay? This is kind of a big win for a linked list. If each of the objects, the values, the elements that are stored in a list, if they're very big and very complex and are difficult to move around in memory, then storing them in a linked list might be better if you want to sort them, okay? Sort them by relinking them and leaving them where they are can be faster than yeah, you know, sorting them if they're in a vector or something like that. So this is the exact same example code we just saw, except I changed vector to list here and here, okay? And remember, we cannot call standard sort on a list. That's the whole point of this one. And when we sort a list, you don't put the uh, open-ended range in here. The sort runs on the whole list, okay? And it's a member of the list template itself. So we're going to just call sort on the list, right? Then I'll print it out. Then what do we got? If we want to use a comparator, again, we just call sort on the list itself. We're not going to specify the range like we did up here. We're going to just put the comparator in there, print it out, and maybe we'll do another comparator starting at the second character, sort it again, and go on our merry way. Okay, let's see how that goes. The results should be the same. Random initial, sorted, using the default, sorted starting on the second character, right? ANA comes before EBR, comes before ELL, and so on. And then if we start the string in the second character of the string, or offset two, we should say, right? Because the first one is number zero, one, two, right? BRA comes before EPH, and so on across the line. So if you want to sort the standard list, there's a way to do that as well. And it looks very much like the standard template sort function, except it doesn't accept the open-ended range. All right, so that's really all there is to sorting these containers. Thanks for watching. See you next time.